The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living hell will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome back to Pastor Yeshua. In this second part of our episode, we continue our study of the various types and shadows of the Bible. In this, the conclusion of our episode, we are focusing our attention on the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, as previously stated, is ground zero for any proper understanding of Scripture. In our previous episode, we saw that God created Adam and Eve and all that was in perfection as his image bearers. We also saw the fact that God, who is omnipowerful, omniscient, and immutable, created Adam and Eve with free will, i.e. the power to choose. Lastly, we saw that God gave Adam and Eve something to choose, i.e. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For as we will see, without choices, the ability to choose is meaningless. In ending our discussion in the previous episode, we cited Romans chapter 10, verse 10, regarding the issue of demonstrating choice and trust, which says, quote, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, unquote. Now in Adam and Eve's case, they turned from belief and faith that God would be their covering of good, i.e. righteousness, which made them his image bearers. Adam and Eve consummated their disbelief with their mouths by their action of eating the fruit of self-sufficiency. In the case of the believer, God's grace allows us each to turn from the pretenses of our abilities and efforts and recognize the complete moral depravity, self-insufficiency, and impotence despite the best knowledge of good and evil possible. With our mouths, we are able through His Spirit to confess all of our best efforts have failed. All of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our failed attempts, past, present, and future, have been nailed to the cross. The penalty of death, which is separation from God due to Adam and Eve's decision to eat the fruit, 
I do things by their own efforts, was paid in full by the death of Jesus, who is the substance of Adam. By the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection, we who are buried with him by confession of faith in his work are again covered by his righteousness. It is by the power of his indwelling spirit that we are transformed, conformed, and sanctified to once again possess his image-bearing qualities. Adam and Eve clearly demonstrated distrust, unfaithfulness, and unreliability through their actions. God, however, will always maintain his nature of trustworthiness, faithfulness, and reliability. Since God cannot change or lie, God would have to find a way to remain faithful to his nature, his word, and his promise. God has spoken and proclaimed to Adam and Eve that their choice to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would cause death, i.e. spiritual separation from his presence. Therefore, God himself would have to initiate, fulfill, and render payment of this debt to bridge the gap created by Adam and Eve. As long as Adam and Eve maintain the focus of their trust in God, they remain perfect and good in God's estimation. As long as they maintain faith in God, they remain covered by the clothing of God's image-bearing glory given freely to them at creation. Notice that when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, Scripture records that their eyes were opened and that they saw that they were naked. Certainly, the axiomatic truth could not be more obvious. Can Adam and Eve be focusing their attention, care, and concerns upon God alone if they are examining their own condition? No. In fact, the instant they take their eyes, their focus, their trust, and faith off God, they see that they are no longer clothed by God's glory. Instead of being like God and having his glory, the knowledge promised by the fruit of the tree brought them both the realization that they were naked. In this case, as in every case, man's efforts outside righteousness by faith through God's grace bring shame as the result. Consequently, their instinct was to vainly attempt to replace God's glory and covering by their own crude efforts. Now, the use of the phrase, quote, their eyes were opened, unquote, is of curious interest. Typically, when we use this phrase, it is used to conjure up ideas of making some kind of intellectual or spiritual enlightenment or progress. Yet in this case, the outcome would clearly indicate that in contrast to progress, Adam and Eve and all of mankind would forever suffer terrible setback. Since Adam and Eve were created perfect, we could hardly make the case that either one of them had problems with their eyesight. The only thing that makes sense is that as Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they looked upon themselves for the first time based upon their own merits and efforts with full discernment and awareness of what is required by God's law to be fully righteous. As they did so, they were simultaneously comparing what they were viewing in themselves and with all honesty looking at the fullness of God's righteousness. In comparing the two, both Adam and Eve were instantly able to see and discern with all reality the complete nakedness and inadequacy of every aspect outside of God's glory. Adam and Eve are perhaps the only humans who have the distinction of being able to see firsthand the utter disparity between the glory to be found in being God's image bearer and being separated by sin from God's image. Few, if any other humans, since Adam and Eve, can fully comprehend what it is like to be God's image bearers. Since we cannot fully comprehend being God's image bearer, there is also proportionally an inability to comprehend to what degree we fall short as a result of sin. Adam and Eve had the advantage of having eyesight to see God's image as well as being able to see themselves as his image bearers. They believed wrongly that eating the fruit would open their eyes and give them advantage of knowing and perceiving good and evil in and of themselves on par with God by their own merits. 
However, there is a consequential reality initiated upon eating the fruit which is never directly discussed, but becomes increasingly obvious with time. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and particularly as time progressed with their descendants, something happened. As time progressed, mankind became spiritually myopic. Mankind lost or forgot the image of God's glory. As they lost view of God's image, mankind also lost their ability to see their own depravity apart from God. In fact, over time, the comparison, if any, was no longer God and His glory, but rather the glory of God's creation. Finally, God would be shut out altogether except for rare occasions, and mankind made comparison to the creature and ultimately to himself. At long last, when mankind began comparing himself by himself, he, like Satan, no longer sees sin, but rather he sees his own supposed beauty apart from God. In our story, after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they eventually anticipate encountering God. As they did so, they are already convicted by the knowledge that they still have of having seen God's image. As they do so, they are already convicted by the knowledge they still have of having seen God's image. They both know full well that neither of them is clothed with God's glory due to having trusted in their own corrupt clothing of self-righteousness. Because they know God's glory, they see the reality of their own clothing of self-righteousness for what it is, nakedness. In desperation, Adam and Eve did what all men do. They used the baser elements around them in a hopeless and fruitless effort to clothe themselves and hide their shame. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 gives an interesting insight. Quote, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden, unquote. The original language within the phrase, quote, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, unquote, literally states that Adam and Eve turned away from the face of, or turned their back to the face of God. This is highly significant because rather than the understanding that Adam and Eve were merely hiding as in a game of hide and seek, Adam and Eve may have been making a conscious spiritual effort to turn from God. As a reminder, turning from something is essentially the definition for the word repentance. By further reminder, when we turn to God, we are in the act of turning or repentance. When we turn from God, we call the act rebellion, and we call the result sin. The end result for Adam and Eve seem to support the premise for this interpretation. As they both attempt to hide from God's presence, God asked Adam, quote, where are you, unquote. God was not deceived, nor was Adam or Eve hidden from God's view. God was not asking Adam or Eve in a geographical question because Adam or Eve were concealed or lost. The question posed by God was designed to have Adam and Eve examine their current spiritual positioning relative to him. The question at theological length being asked was and is, now that you have taken your trust and faith off me, and place that trust and faith in your own efforts and wisdom, where do you stand? The answer, sadly, is the logical consequence chosen by both. Adam and Eve stand separated from God by the knowledge of their condition outside God's covering, glory, and grace by their choice to distrust God and to trust their own efforts. The effect is that a relationship bound together exclusively by faith was forever broken due to a change in Adam and Eve which affected them both at every level to the core. This decision of distrust was like a lethal dose of radiation which permeated and transformed the very spiritual and physical DNA of Adam and Eve. 
once introduced, this poison was like a cancer which would forever remain spread and be passed on to every generation to all of their posterity. Neither Adam nor Eve or their descendants would be able to cure themselves from this terminal condition. When Adam and Eve attempted to cover their own nakedness, God clearly saw their condition as entirely insufficient. When Adam and Eve confessed their disobedience, God pronounced the curse for Adam and Eve and for all mankind as a consequence of the choice they themselves had made to separate their faith relationship. Despite the profound disappointment and loss of this terrible moment, Scripture records that it was at this time that Adam named his wife Eve. Given the fact the ultimate end result of their choices and failure was death, it seems strange and contradictory that Adam would name his wife Eve at that point, which means, quote, mother of the living, unquote. This may likely be the first act of faith declared by man after the fall. Either Adam is being superficial and facetious, or he is recognizing God is going to provide a way of resolution, a way of redeeming them from death to life despite the circumstances. Immediately after naming Eve, God replaced the aprons which Adam and Eve had fashioned for themselves and gave them coats of skins which they used to cover themselves. In case we miss the point, some animal which was still alive and had not sinned had to die, apparently by God's own hand, so that this animal could serve as a substitute covering for Adam and Eve's nakedness. This animal is the propitiatory type of Jesus, who likewise had no sin. Jesus submitted himself to death, ultimately by his own hand, by his sacrifice and resurrection, to be a covering for all those who, by his grace, through faith, choose to clothe themselves with his righteousness. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, God frequently observes that because of sin, mankind is blind. Jesus diagnoses the state of man as being in spiritual blindness. Like many of the physically blind whom Jesus healed, Jesus wants to heal not only physical blindness, but in particular, spiritual blindness. Jesus is seeking those to whom he, by help of the Holy Spirit, can heal their spiritual blindness. By his grace, we can once again, like Adam and Eve, see our spiritual nakedness. We can see our total lack and inability by our own merits to be God's image bearer. Unlike Adam and Eve, who had no remedy but to cover themselves with earthly aprons, we, by faith, are covered by the blood of Jesus' sacrifice and death, just as God in type covered Adam and Eve with the animal skins by its death. Moreover, we are not cast out of God's presence, but instead, by Jesus' resurrection and intercession, we may once again enter and remain in God's presence where we are seen as his image bearers through Jesus Christ. It is interesting to note two issues. One, God gave the command to Adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before God created Eve. There is no recording in Scripture of God personally repeating the command directly to Eve once she was created. We know that Eve was aware of the command since she debated the issue with the serpent. The question is, who told Eve? Did God repeat himself directly to her? Or did Adam relay the command from God to her? It's a fine point, but if God told Eve directly then it seems her guilt is greater since she clearly had no excuse for confusion. On the other hand, if she received the information from Adam, Eve is still guilty, but it opens the door, however slight, for her to claim she misunderstood or that Adam was not clear. It is typically assumed that when the serpent suggests she will not surely die, that Satan is suggesting confusion between Adam and God about the rules or the penalty. While this is ultimately true, it may also be that the immediate implication for the confusion Satan suggests is between Adam and Eve. 
If so, this may explain the dialogue which results when God walks in the garden and Adam and Eve confess their actions. Remember, Adam blames Eve for eating the fruit, saying in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, quote, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat, unquote. Eve, in turn, blames the serpent. God eventually places Eve in submission to Adam, which perhaps tends to substantiate the possibility Satan was placing the initial doubt between Adam and Eve. Second, it is clear that, according to Scripture, that the serpent first interacted with Eve in the garden, deceiving and tempting her into eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is not recorded is what Adam was doing during this meeting. Either we must assume Adam was elsewhere in the garden, or he was right there with Eve and chose to allow her to dialogue with the serpent and make this critical decision to disobey God without so much as a word recorded. If Adam was there with Eve, consenting by silence to her decision, then Adam clearly abandoned any pretense of assuming leadership. If this is the case, it is difficult, if not impossible, to imagine God later pronouncing Adam as being over his wife Eve. If that were the scenario, are we to expect that Adam would exercise better authority post-fall with sin over his wife than he had exercised pre-fall without sin? Although it is possible, it would seem more logical then to believe Eve first ate of the fruit during Adam's absence, however brief. If Adam was absent and came afterwards, then what, if anything, did he see when he arrived? Was Eve already affected in some physically discernible manner? Had Eve already lost her covering and was therefore naked both to herself, to Adam, and to God? If Eve was changed in some way discernible, what was Adam's reaction? Further, since Eve was now offering him to eat of the fruit as she had done, wouldn't Adam have seen and now realized what the demonstrable results were to eating that fruit? If so, during this period, Eve was now fallen along with her image-bearing characteristics, while Adam, for the moment, maintained his relationship and status with God. It is fascinating to ponder what would have happened from this point if Adam had singularly refused to eat the fruit. For example, what would have happened to Adam and Eve's relationship? If they were not able to fellowship in divergent states, what of God's plan to be fruitful and multiply? If they were able to overcome their differences and reproduce, then what would be the status of their children? Would their children be fully fallen? Fully good? Or would they have been in some hybrid condition? Perhaps even more interesting is to ask what Adam's motives were for eating the fruit. We know from what was recorded and what has been so far discussed what the possible beliefs Eve had of eating the fruit. But what of Adam? Did Eve simply repeat what the serpent said to her and then offered the fruit to Adam? Did Eve make her own appeal to Adam to eat the fruit? Or did Adam simply take the fruit and eat without questioning as if he was being offered a sample of a homespun meal Eve had just finished cooking. Is it possible that Adam saw Eve's fallen condition and fully understood the consequences? If so, then it is also possible Adam fully knew with clarity that eating the fruit would result in the same fallen condition to himself. If Eve herself recognized her fallen condition after having broken fellowship with God, disobeying God, and eating the fruit, why would she offer the fruit to Adam knowing that Adam would suffer the same consequences? In the end, it must be asked whether Adam ate the fruit for the same motivations as Eve, i.e. to be like God and stop trusting God by default, or is it possible that Adam at least partly ate the fruit due to his love for Eve, his desire not to be alone as he was before Eve's creation, which was not good. 
perhaps Adam made the choice at some level to divest himself of the glory God had imparted him with because of his love for his helpmate Eve. When all is said, Adam's decision is the type and the shadow cast by the substance of Jesus Christ revealed so eloquently by the Apostle Paul through inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the Epistle of Romans, beginning at chapter 5, verse 12, where we read, quote, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so, by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord." Unquote. We will not know Adam and Eve's motives and thoughts until we reach eternity and can ask them. But it is of interest to note Scripture records that Jesus, who is the substance of Adam's type, humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. While in this form, Jesus conformed himself in every way to every law and fulfilled all righteousness perfectly. In point of fact, Jesus answered the challenge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and executed its contractual obligations fully and completely. Jesus did not simply know good and evil. He had the power to do, and in fact did only and always what was perfectly good in every way, as that is his nature. Jesus not only did good, but was perfectly good. In doing so, Jesus could fully satisfy God. He not only could be like God, but he could be very God because he was fully God and fully man. As a result, Jesus was and is a bridge between sinful man and holy God. Because Jesus is fully man, he is our kinsman in the flesh. Because he is fully God, he stands forever glorified at the right hand of God the Father. Because he died for our sins, he is our kinsman redeemer. Thus, Jesus, like the type of Adam, chose to take the form of a servant, and while a man, divested himself of the glory he shared with the Father before the world began. Whereas Adam could choose to join his wife, it was not within his power to redeem her. Conversely, Jesus, the second Adam, chose to humble himself and tabernacle in the flesh, whereby he might offer to join himself to his bride, i.e. Eve, the church. Furthermore, Jesus thereafter sacrificed himself on behalf of his bride as payment for her sin through the death of the cross, and thereby redeemed her to himself by his own power, by his resurrection to the Father. Earlier, we pondered the question, why did God place the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? At its very core, the choice given Adam and Eve was a quintessential representation of trust and faith. It was not a test. 
It was a free will choice, a dichotomous decision between divergent directions and destinations, either one of which carried eternal consequences by Adam and Eve once it was made. Ultimately, true choice only remains valid when there is more than one option. God seeks devotion, faith, and trust in Him. Without the ability to dissent, however, the decision to exercise the trust and faith God desires has no meaning. Consequently, in order for the choice to have meaning and validity to God, it was God's good pleasure to create man with the initial ability to exercise the choice to freely seek and to trust God. In other words, for paradise to remain paradise, we must have the ability to exercise choice for paradise to have any meaning, or paradise is no more paradise, but is instead prison. Thus, once we remove the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we remove choice. Once we remove choice, even the best of gardens becomes and remains a cage. As we look at our study, you may think that the title, The Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil, is somewhat obscure. Given the fact we live in a world driven by the pursuit of knowledge, enlightenment, and education, it seems contradictory to imagine any of these terms as being counterproductive. It certainly seems harsh and merciless to pronounce the loss of paradise, not to mention death due to the quest of mere knowledge. But what is in view is far more than the quest of intellectual enhancement. Given the total circumstance and outcome, several titles might be suggested to give understanding to what human language is oftentimes insufficient. Let the listener consider the following alternative titles for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the law. The tree of self-trust the tree of separation from God based upon our own merits, the tree of positional standing apart from God, or the tree of self-works versus faith in God alone. Whatever title you choose, the effect is the same. Throughout the thousands of years since the fall, the scenario of the garden is played out. Countless men and women have lamented the choice their ancestors Adam and Eve made. It is easy to say, I wish Adam and Eve had refused to eat the fruit and said no to the serpent. Or, I wish Adam and Eve had chosen to simply trust God. But the reality is that the choice echoes and plays itself out repeatedly in its various forms within the hearts and minds and souls of man even to this day. The cancer which struck Adam and Eve remains steadfast within every man and woman and has lost none of its potency. In a sense, the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil grows before us all and is every bit as appealing to the nature and to the eyes as it was in the beginning. God, in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, is still calling to us as he was to Adam and Eve in the garden to place our unconditional trust and faith in him. Many have, are, and will, despite the consequences of death and separation, tragically choose to take a bite of the fruit of the tree. Tragically, far too many people on a personal level today not only take a bite of the apple, but eat the entire apple and ask for more. Many churches and religions attempt to pick the tree bare, make apple pies, and sell them to the masses who consume them with pride and gluttony in fruitless attempts to supplant their own efforts, deeds, works, and ostensible goodness to please themselves or to become like God. Others will day by day, moment by moment, choose to place their trust in Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone. To those who do so, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, again promise, saying, quote, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For scripture saith, 
Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Unquote. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, the believer is encouraged with these words, quote, And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Unquote. The death of Christ on the cross is a substitutionary debt due by Adam and Eve and all mankind which Jesus paid in full to God the Father on our behalf by turning from our own way, i.e. repenting, and placing our confession of faith and trust in Jesus' all-sufficiency, Jesus heals the separation caused by sin by entering the heart of the believer. Jesus remains steadfast in our heart by faith through grace where he again clothes the believer with his imputed righteousness. This imputed righteousness justifies us before God and we are no longer naked in his presence. The believer is restored in God's holy eyes as the image of his beloved son shines through the life of the believer as his image bearer. We are once again able to experience fellowship with God. As the believer continues to abide by faith in Christ, the power of Christ's resurrection which brought him to life, to glorification, and to the right hand of the Father transforms and sanctifies the believer day by day. At long last, by God's grace and power, we are promised in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the following, quote, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is." Unquote. Father, looking back, we confess that we each and all have broken fellowship with you by unbelief. We know that by our own pride and arrogance, we were turned away from the simplicity of resting in the covering of your grace to the vanity and emptiness of our own righteousness. We give all honor, glory, and praise that by your grace you have called us to be separate from the penalty of death to the promise and assurance of eternal life through faith and trust in the covering and righteousness of your Son Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I invite you, if you have any questions, to send me an email at Pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P A S T O R underscore Y E S H U A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Trust in